Good morning. It's the season of Christmas. But it would not benefit us to merely romanticize Christmas without making efforts to understand its true biblical and greater significance and its impact on us and on the entire human race. The real significance of Christmas, I believe, is twofold. The first is obvious and clear. It's about the first coming of Jesus, the Son of God, who came to save us from our sins. But there's a second very important significance, and that is the second coming of Jesus, to take us, his people, to be eternally with him. Now, these two mega gigantic events are which hold the entirety of time and history of humanity together. Recently, I had a friend who nailed a plaque to his wall, and it said something like this, Christ is life and everything else is details. And that's true, my brothers and sisters. It's in the primacy of Jesus Christ, his supremacy and centrality that everyone and everything finds its place, meaning, and purpose on this earth and in the entirety of the universe. So the birth of Jesus and especially the cataclysmic events that followed and that is his sinless life, his death, his burial, and then his glorious resurrection are the foundation of our faith. What we understand today as the gospel. And so the gospel is the birth, sinless life, his death on the cross for our sins, his burial and his glorious resurrection. And that is the foundation of our faith. Now keep that in mind. But the second coming of Jesus and the events that will follow, that is the judgments, the rewards, and then everlasting life of infinite joy and scope are the foundation of our hope. That is our future perfection and glorification. The foundation of our faith and the foundation of our of our hope. So, what holds all of this together is the boundless, immeasurable love of God. So, the Apostle Paul writes, now abide faith, hope, and love. For the greatest of these is love. Now, both these events, that is first of his birth, his first coming, and now what we're looking forward to earnestly with excitement, his second coming, are inseparable from each other. Let us read our first passage for this morning, the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to verse 11. Now, this is just after um, Jesus had risen from the dead. He was with his disciples for about 40 days, and he um, gave so many signs and evidence and proofs of his resurrection from the dead bodily. And then he gave his final instructions. And then the Bible says, and Luke writes this for us in, in his account in the book of, in the Acts of the Apostles. It says from verse 9, first chapter. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on. And a cloud received them out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. Wow. Verse 11. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So my dear brothers and sisters, here are these two gigantic events. The birth of Jesus, which is the foundation of our faith, and then the 
the second coming of Jesus, which is the foundation of our hope. These two gigantic events are inseparable from each other. And Christmas is a celebration of his first coming, but it reminds us and increases our anticipation of his second coming. And between these two gigantic events is what we have known to be called as the church age or the age of grace. And this has been the period of the last almost 2000 years of fervent intercessions, global missions, evangelism, discipleship, church planting, the Lord working with his people across the globe as they have carried the gospel to the ends of the earth. The Lord has been redeeming, calling unto himself people from every nation, tribe, people, language, confirming his word with signs and wonders and miracles. And the goodness and the love of our Lord has come to hundreds of millions of people across the generations as the church has been his body, his hands, his feet, and has been communicating his love and power and making it tangible through a mega tsunami of good works. You know, today is the 19th of December, 2021. And here we are, this phenomenal generation, living literally on the edge, at the end of these 2,000 years of the church age. And there's so much that God has done in these past 2,000 years. But especially in these last 200 years, the work of the Lord has exploded like a nuclear explosion. People and places that were earlier completely unreached have received the gospel. The Bible has been translated in hundreds of new languages and the work of the Holy Spirit through the church only continues to grow. So standing strong on the foundation of the benefits of our Lord's first coming, which we know is the gospel, we look forward to the consummation of our hope in his second coming. Hope is absolutely the greatest treasure every believer carries within them. I want to quote Derek Prince as he had written this. And this is what he says. The thing that protects the mind of the believer is hope. It's an attitude of optimism. Every believer is obligated to be an optimist. To be a pessimist is to deny your faith. We have to rehearse the gospel, stand on our faith, treasure our hope, and cultivate a positive mental attitude, a confident expectation of good in every situation and circumstance. Hope is the protection of the mind, is what Derek Prince says. Hope is the protection of the mind. So my dear brothers and sisters, what is that unshakable hope? What is that impenetrable hope that protects our mind? guards our heart, keeps us on track, helps us go through temporal painful afflictions and tribulations with a sense of optimism. What is the greatest hope that we have? Is that one day the Lord is going to come and take us to be with him in a place of eternal and infinite joy, beloved, where every, every question will be answered, every tear will be wiped away, Every hope, little of little hope that you have had entrusted to the Lord will come true. So beloved, in this season of Christmas, I want to encourage you to remember that he who came the first time as a lowly babe is now getting ready to come the second time as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is the real significance of Christmas, beloved. Now, there are extremes to be avoided in this. Is there, if there is a lack of Bible study, then there are two extremes that can happen, both of which need to be avoided. The, extreme, the first extreme is this, what I would call extreme A, is being casual, callous, ignorant. It's the attitude that says, it does not matter. You know, don't make a big deal about the shadow, you know. And over-romanticize Christmas to be something that actually the Lord did not will it to be. So it's like what Jesus said would be like the days of Noah. It's an absolute brazen worldliness. Or there could be a subcategory in that extreme, and that is what I would call Christian ignorance. 
or Christian uh, indifference. The attitude that says, oh, don't worry about uh, what's happening around us. Don't worry about these signs and, you know, these end times and stuff like that. When he comes, you'll know. Now, the problem with this kind of opposition in this first extreme is that it's absolutely unbiblical. Such a possession, position which is callous, casual, careless, ignorant, leads to an aimless, fruitless, and worse still can lead to an immoral life as the Lord had himself warned as recorded in the Gospels, especially Matthew 24, 25. Because the Lord himself gave signs. He himself gave indicators. He himself mentioned about specific events as recorded in the Gospels. And even in the other Old Testament books, we have the books of Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, and especially the, the precious book of Revelation. And there are so many other prophetic passages, both in the Old and New Testament, that have more than a few chapters and verses, all about prophecy, all about signs, events, specific nations being mentioned, indicators of timelines, of times and seasons, to help us have a biblical view of the time we are living in. Let me say this clearly, beloved. Your eschatology, that is your study or understanding of the end times, will determine how you live in this present time. So extreme A says, A, doesn't matter. And that doesn't matter attitude shows in the life. It shows in, a, in an aimless life, a worldly life, a careless life, or a materialistic life. Now there is another extreme, extreme B. Now, people with such a mindset are basically freaking out. And they're getting hyper-reactive about these end times. And what happens is that they stop living their roles and responsibilities before the Lord. They stop doing everything that is right and necessary as commanded by the Lord. And they're just, just waiting for the Lord to come and take them. Now, this is warped. It's dysfunctional and can lead to Anxiety that leads to unnecessary frustrations and depression for the concerned person and for those around them. So, in the season of Christmas, what should be the right posture, biblically? You know, a lady once asked John Wesley that if he were to know that he would die at 12 a.m. midnight tomorrow, how would he spend the intervening time? That's today till tomorrow. His reply was this. Why, madam? Just as I intend to spend it now, I would pre preach this evening at Gloucester and again at five tomorrow morning. After that, I would ride to Tewkesbury, preach in the afternoon and meet the societies in the evening. I would then go to Reverend Martin's house, who expects to entertain me, talk and pray with the family as usual, retire to my room at 10 o'clock, commend myself to my heavenly father, lie down to rest, and wake up in glory. To paraphrase and explain what I just quoted John Wesley saying, was that he would do what he was when he was asked what he would do if he were to die or if the Lord was to return at that time the next day, what he said in effect was this, I'll go to bed, go to sleep, wake up in the morning, do my work as I believe it has been appointed by the Lord, for I would want him to find me doing what he has appointed for me. On the other side, in other words, if you really got to know that tomorrow is your last day, either by your death or the Lord's return, and you now begin to drastically change how you are living and what you are doing for these remaining hours, then there is something very wrong right now about how you're living presently and what you are doing. The fact is that, that the Lord wills as his people that we live continually in a healthy tension that helps us to live in joyful anticipation, faithfulness, 
and fruitfulness. This tension is us being sandwiched between these two scriptural truths in the same chapter of the Gospel of Matthew 25. Now, Jesus put it very rightly. He positioned these two verses very rightly and made it easier for us to understand, you know, how to live in this joyful tension, a joyful anticipation and excitement of his coming. Though it's not going to be easy around us. It's going to be perilous times. It's going to be difficult times. But yet the joy and the hope that we carry of his second coming would help us go through whatever comes our way, knowing that he will perfect that which concerns us. So what are these two verses, you know, these two scriptural verses uh, in the Gospel of Matthew? Let's, let's go there, Matthew chapter 25. And it's very interesting. We're going to take certain verses. We'll not read through the entire chapter. I would actually encourage you to read through those chapters of 24 to 25. Um, but let's just focus on some verses so that we will be able to have our position right, uh, as is my uh, aim this morning for us. Matthew chapter 25. So here we are in Matthew chapter 25. And look at what Jesus is saying in verse 25. <laughs> I beg your pardon. It is Matthew chapter 24. It's Matthew chapter 24, verse 25. Look at what Jesus says over here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 25. Behold, I have told you in advance. Look at the words of Jesus. Here clearly, behold, I have told you in advance. Why would he tell us in advance? Because he wants us to know in advance. Why does he want us to know in advance? So that we will be prepared in advance, so that we will not live carelessly, we will not live aimlessly, but we will live directionally, we will live purposefully, we will live discerning the times and seasons that we're living in. One of the greatest issues that Jesus had with the Pharisees is, and, and with the nation of Israel is that they did not recognize the time of his coming, though he had told them in advance in all of those Old Testament scriptures, and that's what he told the Pharisees. You read the scriptures, they bear witness of me, but you do not recognize me here. I am standing in front of you. Because you've read the scriptures with a veil upon your hearts. And so Jesus is saying here in Matthew 24, 25, Behold, I have told you in advance. And read, those, read that verse in the context of the entire chapter, where Jesus is actually mentioning specific signs that will begin to happen when his coming, his second coming is nearing. Look at what he says now in verse 33 to verse 34. He says, so you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. When you see all these things, does he expect us to be watchful? Yes, he expects us to be watchful. He wants us to be prayerfully watchful. He wants us to be scripturally watchful. Recognize that he's near right at the door. So the Lord expects us to study his word. In other words, even study to study prophecy, complex as it is. There are names of people. There are names of nations. There are signs. There are secret codes. There are metaphors. There are indicative timelines. Now, did he announce his first coming centuries before about his birth, about the place where he would be born, about where they would go? After his birth, did he, did he mention the, the events of his life? Yes, he did. Why? So that they would recognize him and acknowledge him when he comes. And his first coming in, this, in the season of Christmas that we remember and remind each other was comparatively much quieter. How much more has he not revealed in the scriptures about his second coming? So my dear brothers and sisters, learn to discern the times and seasons we are living in. And let your hope be in the word of God. So that's the scripture A, you know, the first layer of the sandwich. You know, here comes scripture B to put us in this tension, to put us in this position of anticipation and excitement. And scripture B is in the same chapter of Matthew 24, verse 36. And look at what 
Jesus says over here, but about that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, not the son, but the father alone. Now that's interesting. He wants us to know the times and the seasons. He wants us to know. Look at what he said in the previous verse. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. But he says in verse 36, when the door will open and when he will come on that day and hour, no one knows. Now many have misunderstood this verse to think Jesus doesn't want us to know at all when he's coming. He doesn't want us to have any clue. Just, just forget about it. Why are you making such a deal about the end times? My dear friend, we're making a big deal about the end times and we're making a big deal about the signs is because Jesus and the scriptures made a big deal about it. There are entire books on, on the end times. There are so many prophecies that are waiting to fulfill. And the Bible is the only, the only book, which is a prophetic book. And, and such a detailed prophetic book. So when, we, when, you, when you're reading verse 36, so we are, don't misunderstand that the Lord doesn't want us to know when it's nearing. What you will not know is the day and the hour. And that is very specific. Understand, he didn't say, you will not know when I'm coming. He said, you will not know the day and the hour. No one knows. But the time, the zooming in, you will know. Therefore, what he says over here in verse 42 down, go below, be on the alert. For you do not know which day your Lord is coming. He emphasizes that again. Be alert. So this is the sandwich we're living in, beloved. We, you know, we're sandwiched between these two verses that will help us to be on track, that will keep us wise and discerning and directional in the way we live, purposeful. We, we, we will help us to be faithful to God. But the other verse helps us to not freak out. It helps us, if you won't know the hour, you won't know the day, but you will know the times. So be alert, be watchful, be faithful, fulfill your role and responsibility as a disciple of Jesus. As, you, as a husband, as a father, as a son, as a brother, as a servant of God, be faithful. Blessed is the man whom the master finds doing what he has commanded him to do. So this, I believe, is the right posture, my, my brothers and sisters, you know. In the season of Christmas, don't overly romanticize Christmas to be something that it is not. He came the first time. He came, he fulfilled his purpose for which he came. And that is the gospel. That is the foundation of our faith. Thank God for what he's done in these 2,000 years. Today, on this 19th of December, 2021, we are on the, we're, on the, we're literally living on the edge. And we are looking forward to the fulfillment of the foundation of our hope. And that is the second coming of Jesus. Everything is around this, these two mega gigantic events. So how are you going to live your life? What is this Christmas going to be all about? More shopping? More eating, only mere celebrating, only giving gifts, receiving gifts. Yeah, all that is good. But above all, what should be burning and churning in your heart? Lord, I want to live for you. Lord, I want to be faithful. Lord, I want to preach the gospel to more people. I want to reach out to people with the good news. I want to end this year well. Help me to have a good closure to this year. Help me to have less of baggage. Help me to take your yoke upon upon myself, upon my shoulders, for your yoke is easy and my burden and your burden is light and help me to be positioned rightly for this new year. Oh God, help me. So, Bible-based anticipation is the right posture. Read and study the Bible. Understand the signs. Appreciate that the Lord has given us clear signposts, names of nations, nature of events, timelines. Increased Bible study makes us walk in the brighter light of God's word, causing us to have a sound biblical overview of ourselves and of the world around us. Secondly, prayerful alertness. The greatest evidence of our integrity is our secret prayer life before God. That's what will keep the oil full in our lamps, beloved. Remember the parable of the ten virgins? So if you want the oil your lamps to be full of oil. Increase your prayer life. Pray a lot in tongues. Pray a lot in known and unknown tongues, but especially pray a lot in tongues. And ask the Lord to help you to keep your lamps full of oil. Be full of the Holy Spirit. 
Thirdly, grace empowered faithfulness. As I mentioned earlier, when Jesus said, and he said specifically use this parable with respect to the second coming. Blessed is the man or the servant whom the master finds doing what he commanded him to do. Fulfill your roles and responsibilities. So may the season of Christmas increase our anticipation, excitement, and preparation for the coming of our Lord. I pray that truly you will have a beautiful time in the season of Christmas, enjoying the love and the nearness of the Lord, enjoying the love and nearness of your loved ones, your family, your friends. Celebrate truly because he came to save us from our sins. But keep looking up as recorded for us in Luke chapter 21. He said, look up for your redemption draws near. What the angel told those disciples as recorded in Acts 1 for, was for them specifically that don't get so caught up about, your, about his coming back or his going rather, about his going that you're not doing what he's commanded you to do. But today, 2,000 years later, look up, Luke 21, 25 to 28, for your redemption draws near. Behold, he's at the door, but which day and hour the door will open, we will not know. So be alert, be faithful, be ready. Let your lamps be full of oil. Celebrate the Lord in the season of Christmas and not just celebrate, make him known. The Lord bless you. Father, we thank you for this uh, precious word that has come as a reminder that here we are in the season of Christmas, remembering what you have done for us, Lord, that, that you came as a lowly babe, born in a manger in the little town of Bethlehem. But you foretold your coming. But many, especially many learned, ignored. But to those who received you, you gave them the right to be called children of God. Here we are, the church, 2,000 years later. There's so much you've done, God. But we, are, we know we're on the brink of awesome things, God. And that is your coming, Lord. So come, Lord, help us to be prepared as your church. Help us not to be consumed or overwhelmed with the things that are of this world. But help us to be faithful to you, set apart unto you, our lamps full of oil, to be waiting and watching, fulfilling our responsibilities, but waiting and watching in the light of your word, in prayerfulness, in earnestness. Oh God, for you are truly at the door and your reward is with you. Help us, Lord. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you.